So welcome everyone to our next lecture on probabilistic reasoning and machine learning. Today we continue with support vector machines and we will finish the topic. Yeah, so today we will get to the kernel trick. We will get to the stuff that is most exciting about support vector machines. So far it was a linear method, right? Linear methods are nice. It's a nice intuition with the margin. But the actual power comes when you combine it now with kernel functions and that's what we are going to do today. Okay? Um, however, what did we get already? Um, we got already some linear support vector machine formulation. And it is easier to understand it without the kernel stuff. Okay? Also, it's easier first to learn about the separable case to understand where does this optimization problem come from? Why is maximizing the norm of this vector um, or minimizing the norm of the vector? Why is, is maximizing the margin? That is best understood if you look at the separable case. Okay, and then you already learn something about Lagrange multiplier and all this kind of stuff. You learn basically as much as possible, and then you go one step further and say, okay, let's introduce lag variables for the non separable case. That's now a trivial step, and the rest stays the same. Surprisingly, in the dual formulation, only one little thing changes. Now there's only an another box constraint for the alphas. Yeah? Now, how do we get a nonlinear support vector machine? Okay, this is what we are talking about today, the nonlinear case. And another name for the lecture today would be the kernel trick. Okay, where I don't know whether people are still excited about the kernel trick. Like in year 2000, everyone wanted to know about the kernel trick because everyone had some linear method that they tried to nonlinearize. Nonlinearize, is that a word? So try to make a nonlinear version of. For example, of course, then there was a nonlinear PCA. We will look at it in a couple of lectures, which is the kernelized version of PCA. And there was a kernelized linear regression, a kernelized Fisher discriminant analysis, a normalized quadratic discriminant, and whatever. Quadratic is already a bit, uh, bit nonlinear. But in principle, every linear method um, you could take out from the statistics book and you could think, can I apply the kernel trick? And when you can, you had a new RIPS paper. Okay? So that's Quite nice. That's why it's such an exciting idea. So it's an idea that is very generally applicable. Um, however, was it completely new? No, not at all. I already in the 70s, there's Grace Waba. Grace Waba, um, she's a mathematician who wrote some nice books on, I think, functional analysis. And that's where basically the kernel trick is already in there. So it's already used there for something very similar. However, as you know, as computer scientists, we are super lucky. We have hardware that the past didn't have, so we can just do the same thing as what people did in the past, but with better machines, with more computation, and we can have new results that people were not able to get before. So that was maybe the case here too. People were bringing the right things together. They had the computational power, they had the data set, and so they could make nice research about it. Okay, um, you can also have a look at a really nice paper from Bernhard Schulkopf and some colleagues. Um, on, on the kernel trick, basically, and it's called input space versus feature space in kernel-based methods. I think it's an IEEE paper where you have on the university campus access. If you're at home, it's also an archive. So you can also download it just from this preprint server where you can download many papers, maybe almost all papers. So maybe at first sight, when you look at the paper, it looks a bit tough, right? But ideally, when you understood this lecture completely, like the last three or the last two and today, you should be able to understand it. By the way, that's the point why we don't use SkyKit Learn or something in this lecture, and why we make the lecture, like why we go into the details. So the goal of the lecture is that you should be able to read research papers after this lecture, okay? You could write your bachelor thesis on a research paper after this, ideally, okay? It is like making a big step, like having like the steps are this high and you need to climb up a bit, so it's not so easy. You cannot just step on them, so it's really you have to it's a bit tough, and at first sight, it's hard to read. But then after a while, you get more comfortable, and you see that it's always kind of the same stuff, and, and you, sh you should be able to do this. So have a look at this paper. It's a good description of lots of the material. Um, since some of the material of today is really somewhat tough, I moved it to an appendix already last year. So I kept it out of this lecture, but it is in the slides still. So the appendix is explaining many of the things that appear in this paper. Yeah? So if there are some things in the paper that you don't get, some maps or something, I give also explanation. And you can also look at older videos online 
I think from uh, Heinrich Heine University, they also have a Mediathek where there are lots of lectures also stored. Okay, but let's get started. So we still talk about the classification problem, yeah? So we are given some patterns, yeah? And some class labels for each of the patterns. Typically, we draw it on the board, then we have x1 and x2, then we are in the r to the 2. And the r to the 2 is, uh, in most cases, already interesting enough. Um, the goal in classification is to find a decision function, yeah, f that maps my patterns onto the class labels. And of course, it's nice to do it on the given training data set, but the goal, of course, is to do this for new patterns. So far, we looked at the linear case, which means the decision boundary is linear, so just a straight line or a hyperplane. And today, we look at the nonlinear case, where we also want to include nonlinearly separating planes. No, it's not a plane. So surfaces, so it's more like a Riemannian manifold in high dimensions, another fancy word for mathematics, but it really is, yeah? So here's this a little cartoon. So far we talked about this situation. We have positive, negative examples, and we're looking for some linear separation that is maximizing the margin, okay? And today we also want to look at nonlinear cases like this. So here is no straight line, right? So, and Typically, your data is not that nice that it looks like this. So your data could be much more complicated. And here, also, we want to have a notion of yeah, drawing some line between. Maybe let me try to do this on the board. So um, we have a couple of positive examples inside. And then some of them outside. And OK, so straight line with a margin. Let's draw something with a margin in here. So something, some reasonable separating manifold. Yeah, manifold is just a sheet of paper curved in high dimensions. Yeah, so something like this. That looks like a reasonable separating plane or separating surface, right? So what is the margin? So the margin will be something like this, right? So this is like the inner part. And it can also have an outer part. And again, let's try to find a solution that is maximizing this margin. OK? So that's the goal. Um, this guy is already on the wrong side, so this would be separable. But of course, again, we might allow also some slack variables here. But we know this is not a big deal. Just take the dual problem and put another box constraint, and then you have the slack variables in there. So this is what we are going to try, OK, to get. Now the question is, OK, what do we have? Oh, that is now almost a slide that I put on the screen before. So we have a method. We have an algorithm for this. We want to have an algorithm for that. We are lazy. We don't want to reinvent the wheel. Oh, this looks like a wheel, but we don't want to reinvent the whole methodology again. So what we are trying to do is, let's try to map this problem onto this problem, OK? So let's kind of transform these patterns in such a way that I can linearly separate them, OK? And that will be called a feature map, a phi. And it's the same thing as these basis functions that we've seen already. So it's very much something similar. So it's a nonlinear function that somehow nonlinear transforms this into this. Hmm, this is strange. So how can I define a function here on 2D? So this is x1 and x2. So how can I, I do this? How can I nonlinear transform it to get it linearly separable? This sounds like a very complicated mapping, but it actually is not if I increase the dimensionality. OK, so those are two axes, but suppose I'm having another one, right? And another one, and another one. So I could have many of those. So I could go from the R to Z2. I could go into the R to Z15. Oh, let's take 17. That's a more fun number. OK, so the space could be much higher dimension, and suddenly we can separate the data, OK? Now, OK, the professor can talk a lot. So is this really possible? Can we really do it? Yes, and it's very easy to see. I have a little demo. So here's my demo for this case. So this is a simple kernel trick example. Oh, where is it? 
Okay, here's my data. Um, okay, how did I gen? So this is the data set that we just seen on the board. Okay, one class inside, the other class outside, and not right now it's in a two-dimensional space. Again, how did I generate it? I did a big Gaussian blob, yeah, with 100 data points, and the first 50 they got kind of scaled up so that they were pushed out. Okay, so that's basically these operations. Again, this operation four times normalize. This thing is not something that you just write down. Yeah, this is after an hour you have it right, and then you have what you want. Okay, that's the usual way. That will be for you the same thing. Maybe if you're a genius, you can do it in 10 minutes. Okay, and if you have done it a hundred times, you can also do it in 10 minutes, even if you're not a genius. So this is generating the data, and now comes the trick. Let's plot it differently. Let's plot it in 3D. Let's take the first coordinate as the first coordinate, the second coordinate as the second coordinate. Let's invent another one. So and here's the invention. The invention is take the first coordinate and square it. Take the second coordinate and square it. So let's think about it, what it's doing. So the origin is here, and we are squaring each coordinate. This is like calculating the squared norm. This is calculating the distance from the origin squared, right? Nice, because then in the z-coordinate, the blue points, they will get a small z-value, and the red points, they will get a large z-value. Okay, so let's see whether this is true. Okay, this is already the plot, same as before, but now, magically, I can turn it around. And as you can see it, now it's linearly separable. Wow, this is so cool, isn't it? I like it, because, um, so we, Uh, okay, let's take pluses. I switch in a second, but I need to... I try to copy this, this thing here. Okay, so um, that's what I've drawn here. Basically, this should be the 3D situation here. So with three axes, one, two, three axes here now. And um, here I'm having a separating hyperplane that splits the data nicely. And here I also can talk about the margin. And everything is linear, okay? And it's just the R to the 3. That's curious because, um, again, this is a two-dimensional plane here, okay? And my mapping, which was just phi of x1, x2 was mapping to x1 squared, no, not x1 squared, just x1, x2, and then x1 squared plus x2 squared. Is this on the video? Yeah, I think it's small, but it's the same mapping as before, okay, that we just talked about. So this is the mapping here, and um, okay, what properties does it have? It's continuous, it's differentiable, so it's nice and smooth. So nothing weird's happening. So if I map a 2D space into 3D, then the result will be a two-dimensional manifold, which means, so what I'm having here, the data points are not anywhere in 3D, but they are like on a surface, on a two-dimensional surface. However, on a curved one, right? We all know curved surfaces. For example, a soccer ball is a famous curved surface. So that's a 2D thing, this surface, the soccer ball, right? So you can even have coordinates or a map of it if you take off the Earth. So this thing here is really, it's like a bowl, like a bowl, like a salad bowl, this thing. So it's empty inside, yeah? Um, in particular, when I look at it from the top, it just looks like this. This is like looking into the bowl. So why am I telling you all this? Um, now I can ask the question, where does This separating hyperplane here, where does it cut my salad bowl? Okay, where does it cut it? And of course, I know I should draw it something like a bit curved. Okay, so I don't know, let's try to be here super 3D. Yeah, makes sense, kind of. So it's cutting it at some point. And the cut of such a salad bowl with a flat piece of paper, that's a, the line of a circle. And that is exactly this line here. Okay, so the separating line 
in the lower dimensional space yeah, is the intersection of the manifold that I get by embedding it into a high dimensional space with a high dimensional linear plane. Okay? Oh, that's a new explanation. That's new. That's not in the old video. So that I made up. But I think it's nice because the question is where do these lines come from? Okay? And they are really intersections of the, uh, you know, this is also called the image, right? This manifold can be also called the image. It's basically um, phi of r to z2. Yeah? So this is defining some two dimensional manifold in this high dimensional space. Yeah? It's just a curved surface, like a soccer ball. And you cut it with a sheet of paper, with a hyperplane, or with a plane in this case. And the cutting thing here will be, uh, this is not, I should practice the, the drawing thing. But I think you get the idea. OK, so that is exactly this thing over here, which is nice. Of course, now this was nice, right? Because here was the origin right in the center of it. And um, it might not be always the case like that. But you can imagine if the data is different shape and different, there are different nonlinear mappings that you can use to get this situation. I show you another one, by the way. So here's another one. So that was the first one, right? So from here, and suddenly I can um, separate it. And here you also can see that it's really li like a salad dish thing. So it's all on a surface, right? You, with a continuous differentiable mapping, you cannot increase the dimensionality from 2D to 3D. You can only hit a submanifold here, even if you have a nonlinear mapping. OK, let's look at another example. Here's another mapping. Let's square the first coordinate. That's another option. And let's square the second coordinate. And then let's multiply the two coordinates together. Yeah? It's a different mapping. And again, we can have a look at it. And of course, I rotated it beforehand, before the lecture, so that it looks nicely. So where is it? So whoops. Mm. So here we go. OK, so this is now again looking from the top. And again, it's a salad dish. Once I turn it around, then you see that it's, it's, it's a salad dish. But now it's, it's different. Now you see it's like in a corner. So it's now more an object which more looks like a Kegel. It looks a little bit like this. It has a slightly different shape. But of course, I can. And now let me try to do a better job. I can try to intersect it with, with some hyperplane. OK, if I want to do a better job, then this should go away, right? Ah, now, it's, now it's looking OK. Oh, no one can see it. OK, the nice drawing. So here's the nice drawing. So now the mapping, it looks different. So it has like a sharp edge, a, a sharp corner at the point here. So it's like, I don't know, at some origin style thing. And here I'm intersecting again with the hyperplane, this shape. OK? Now put arbitrary polynomials in here. And you have many, many, many shapes. OK? And now put in that with polynomials, in principle, you can approximate all functions. Is this true? Maybe. So, but you can imagine other basis functions that are a complete basis of the, of the full space of all possible functions. And you have many options. OK, so this is nice, right? So it looks like this, but then kind of it, it gets transformed. So now we know that it's really possible. It's not a big deal, actually. Yeah? You can just write down a mapping. Um, so here are both mappings that we've just seen spelled out. Yeah? So one was having two coordinates a and b, and we map it to a, b, and then the norm of a, 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 b, OK? And the other one was a squared, b squared, and then a times b. I put a square root of 2 in front of it. Yeah. But that's just because the, we will look at certain functions that will turn out to generate such feature mappings with a square root of 2 in front of it. That's why it's there. But it's not important. It's just a scaling here. OK? And there are many more. Again, now, just for notation, the problem with notation is always now I'm using A and B. I should have used Greek letters because those are scalars, right? So A and B looks like vectors. But here they are just scalars. Yeah? I didn't want to use alpha and beta because alpha is already taken for Lagrange multipliers. And 
in the support vector machine lecture, the alpha is even a vector, and the alpha i are the entries. I didn't want to use x sub i or x sub 1 and x sub 2 because those are two different data points or two different patterns. Okay, that's the awkward a and b here. I hope that's, that's fine with everyone. It's, the notation is often the most, uh, it's one difficult step to understanding. So I try to keep it simple. Okay, um, now we have our feature map, this one. Let's look at our linear support vector machine. Yeah? Um, and instead of now using the patterns x, we can also plug in phi of x, okay? Um, however, first of all, before we do that, let's look at this thing and first study this inner product. What is an inner product doing? Yeah? Why is an inner product interesting for two points? Basically, first, oh, first on the board, I think I, I draw for you already some diagram where we had a, a vector w, where we even said the norm of w is equal to 1, and some other vector. Um, I think one can draw another picture. Uh, OK, maybe I should have prepared that one. But now I want to show you another picture. So there is, um, hmm. Yeah, basically, if I have two vectors, a and another one, b, I can say the inner product of a and b, if they have length 1, I think is the cosine or something of the angle or so. Something like this. Yeah. At least if the lengths are 1. And if the lengths are not 1, then it's like some normalization in here. So let's make it precise by writing approximate, OK? It is something like. So the inner product, let's think about it for a while. If both point to the same direction, the inner product is 1. If they are orthogonal to each other, one is here, the other one to the other side, then the inner product is 0, OK? Which is, by the way, the cosine of the angle, right? The cosine of 90 degree? No. There's something fishy here. Is it right? It's fine? Oh, yeah, yeah, OK. So here's the cosine. Yeah, OK, OK, great. So this is 90 degree. So that's 0. Perfect. That's good. We can also see what's happening if we point to opposite sides, right? 180 degrees minus 1. Yeah? Very different. Um, in high dimensions, the angle between two vectors is most important. Most, let's say you sample from rand n two vectors in high dimensional, let's say a 100 dimensional rand n vector and another 100 dimensional rand n vector, and you calculate the inner product, it will be approximately equal to zero, which means random vectors in high dimensional are typically on a right angle with each other. So if two vectors have nothing to do with each other, they, are, they have an inner product of zero. So that's a very, well, very good way to compare two vectors. However, intuitively, we are often interested in the distance between these things, OK? Let's see what the relationship between inner product and distances is, OK? I think that's on the slide, and you might have seen it already. So what is the norm of the distance? Yeah, so a minus b is another vector, right? That is this one or the other one, I don't know. And I take the length. So let me write it out in my favorite notation. So this is the same as the inner product of a minus b times a minus b, OK? Let's write it out. So we get a transpose a plus b transpose b minus 2 times a transpose b. So what we see is if the vectors have length 1, these terms are constant, 1, and we see that the inner product is directly related to the square distance. Yeah? So the inner product is like negative of the squared distance, which is interesting. So whether we are measuring inner products between two vectors or whether we are measuring distances, that is something very similar. In particular, we see that all these inner products, if we know all of them, they tell us everything about the distances between two vectors, which kind of makes sense, right? If I have two vectors, and they have a certain angle to each other, I can arbitrarily rotate these two vectors. But the angle doesn't change, and the distance also doesn't change, right? So it's invariant. It works at every location, no matter where I move these vectors. Yeah? So it's kind of the right thing to compare to 
vectors. That's a nice uh, reasoning because it tells us, okay, the support vector machine is doing something very reasonable here, right? So it's comparing the patterns by calculating inner products. Okay? So they are, uh, dot products are the essential ingredient to calculate, for example, distances, right? As we can see down here. Okay, let's plug in our phi of x, right? Our mapping, our map data. Let's plug it into the inner product and let's calculate it, yeah? So that's what, what I did here. I plugged in one of these feature maps and this is the inner product of these two weirdly looking vectors. So it's a square times a prime square. Where does this a prime come from? Okay, so I have an x with entries a and b and I have an x prime with entries a prime and b prime, okay? And I get b square, b prime square and I get all these mixed terms. Surprisingly, this can be written as an inner product between x and x prime. Okay, this is curious. So if I take, um, but then to the power of two. So it's the same as the inner product I had before, but to the power of two. So let's check this, whether this is really true that I wrote here, okay? So let's write it out on the board. I think it's good to see once. Um, maybe I can also change this, I should change the slide a little bit, that it's just on the slide, but uh, sometimes calculations are good. Okay. So, I'm having x is this vector and I'm having x prime is another vector and I have there a certain expression and it says that if I take x transpose x prime squared, then I get this expression. So let's calculate this expression now by hand, okay? So that is a times a prime plus b times b prime and this thing squared. So that is the first term squared plus the second term squared plus the mixed term. Okay, interesting. And now you see, okay, this inner product is an inner product in two-dimensional space, so the summation has two summons. Now I'm having three summons. So I can probably sort it kind of cleverly and get it like as an inner product in a three-dimensional space. And actually that's the case. So I can put the a squared, the b squared, and here I take the a times b, and let's multiply it with square root of two. Okay, so this is a vector, transpose, a prime squared, b prime squared, and then I have a prime, b prime. Let's take another square root of two. And this is the same as that one. And that is exactly the inner product between the mapped points, okay? Yeah, that's nice. It's surprising at first, right? Um, okay, this is an inner product where we apply some nonlinearity to it, but then it turns out it can be also written as an inner product under some certain mapping. So we see, in order to calculate the inner product in, um, in this space, in this R to the 3, yeah, this is a feature space, we call it also feature space, And accordingly, we call the space where our initial data is the input space. So in order to calculate the inner product in feature space, which is this, we could also calculate the inner product in input space and have then some nonlinearity on it. And now an interesting question is, could I use here any function? Could I use exponential, logarithm, whatever, whatever? Yeah, there are many, many possibilities. It must fulfill certain properties. This thing must be a kernel function, and we define exactly what this is in a second. But the story is, write down a kernel function that does something to the entries of these things in input space, for example, squaring them, blah, 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 do some weird things, some nonlinearities. And if this kernel function fulfills certain properties, there is always 
a mapping phi such that it corresponds to some inner product in a higher dimensional space. Okay? So why is it fancy and why is it good for us? Um, we have an algorithm for linear support vector machines and we want to apply it in feature space. So we need to be able to calculate inner products in feature space, these ones here. However, um, ideally we don't want to do this mapping here. We don't want to map all our data points in these high dimensional spaces. Because if we don't have to do this, we can make the spaces really, really large. And with really, really large, possibly even infinitely dimensional. So they can be really, really large. Okay? So if we find a way to calculate inner products in a high dimensional feature space without going there, then that's a big deal. And that is the kernel trick. So the kernel trick is running a linear method in feature space, yeah, where in feature space, in principle, we should have to do inner products. Yeah, but we don't have to do them here. Yeah, we do them in input space with some nonlinear function. Um, I don't know whether you like commutative diagrams. I do. So they sometimes make things more clear. So that's another spontaneous invention for today. So let's say we have this input space. And we can map into some feature space. And then in this feature space, we want to apply linear methods and compute inner products. Yeah, we, are, we have nice methods which just depend on the inner products of our data. Then the kernel trick means how we can also go directly here using a kernel function. So that is a nice diagram for the um, for the kernel trick. Okay, cool. So I, I think by now I told you the same thing already five, ten times, right? In different variations. It's always now the same thing. Let's see how it goes on. Okay, what do I for my slide? So, so yes, the dot product in feature space, which was this one up here, or also written like this, yeah, corresponds to some nonlinear function in input space. And this is called a kernel function. Of course, this kernel function is defined, yeah, so it's, this is the equal colon. So the k is defined by first writing down the phi and then the k. However, it also works the other way around, that you write down a k and you never care about the phi. You never evaluate it. Okay? Good. So far, so good. Um, the idea is yet, it's, it's now to define directly the k without defining the phi. Okay? So and this can be done. So here are answers for possible kernel functions. So first of all, the kernel function that we've seen already, this one up here, it can be generalized. Okay? So we can put arbitrary positive integers as an exponent. And you can imagine this explodes very quickly, right? So you will have many, many entries in your features when you write out the mass. I wrote out the simple case. If you like, do it for three, and you have many, many more entries, and it gets more complicated. This thing is now called the homogeneous polynomial kernel function. OK, it's the first example. In general, one can show there is also a feature map for this polynomial homogeneous kernel function, and it looks like this. If you have entries A, B, C, and so on, so many entries, then in feature space we will calculate all monomials of degree P. Where, again, if you have never heard of monomials, monomials are these things A to the something plus B to the something plus C to the something and so on, where all these exponents sum up to P. Those are all monomials of degree exactly P. Okay? And of course, this is going to combinatorics, right? So this is like going to, I don't know, n choose k or something. So these numbers, they play a role here to calculate the possibilities, the number. So the size of d can be calculated with the closed form, of course, but it gets quickly very, very large. Yeah? So now the nice thing is, for a kernel method, like support vector machine that only looks at the inner products of the data, we just replace the inner product with the kernel function. And by this, we never go to this high dimensional space. We just calculate inner products in the high dimensional space. That is the idea of the kernel trick. 
Um, of course, we can be even more general. So here's a general polynomial kernel. So what has changed? I changed the plus b. That's quite innocent. Typically, we choose plus 1. The, the number doesn't matter, but it must be a non-zero number. Again, for b equals 0, this is a homogeneous polynomial kernel. For b non equals 0, this is called inhomogeneous. Okay? And the difference is this one, um, the first one has all monomials of degree exactly being equal to p. And the second one, if you put a b equals to 1, you will have all monomials up to degree p. So not only the one with p, but you will also have a to the power of 1, a to the power of 2, a to the power of 3, and a times b times c, a times b squared, a times whatever, c squared, and all possible combinations. So it's even more exploding. So the dimensionality of this one is the sum of all the previous dimensionalities stacked on top of each other. So this is um, super fancy. The question is, um, oh, it's not a question anymore by this point. So this is, this is so amazing because before when you looked at linear regression, we did a similar trick, right? We wrote down basis functions and we said, let's take the polynomial up to degree 5 or something. And then we explicitly mapped it. So we had an Excel tape, Excel sheet of with two columns. And after the mapping file, we had an Excel sheet with 10 columns, or with 15 columns, or with 18 columns. And now, if we don't have to do that, we can even go to, in principle, to 10 to the 15 columns. And it's no problem, because all we need to do in feature space is calculate inner products. Okay, And we never map there. So now comes the experts only thing here. So the experts only thing should make some of you really curious, right? And some of you not to worry too much about it if you don't know what I'm talking about. So now, what is the kernel comparing such a polynomial kernel? So, and another way, speaking statistics language, we would say, um, let's say the x comes from a certain probability distribution, OK? It's some high dimensional probability distribution. The x prime is coming from a high dimensional probability distribution. And we are comparing the moments of the class distribution. So we are comparing the higher order moments in principle. Yeah, it's OK. For the non-experts, so what is the moment? So if you have a random variable x distributed according to some distribution, some density, then the expectations of x, that's the mean, that's the first order moment. OK? There's also a second order moment. Yeah, if you take it to the power of 2. And then there are many variations. So this is another second order moment. Okay? This is a centralized moment where I remove the mean first. And this is called the variance. Okay? So the variance is an example of a second order moment. But this thing already is also a second order moment, but not one which is centralized. Now you could imagine, OK, I can also have to the power of p, right? And that the expectation of that one, you never want to calculate it with data. It's very unstable, taking something to a very high power. But in principle, this is telling me something about the distribution. And now it gets even nicer. Why is, are all these moments telling me something about distributions? That is something to do that basically, if you have all moments, so all expectations, yeah, then you know everything about the distribution. And this had basically something that to do with, so such a p can be sometimes written as an exponential of some polynomial, right? And you remember, if you take a parabola, like a squared, uh, a squared polynomial, we have the Gaussian distributions. And remember, the derivatives of these squared exponential, of these squared polynomials, there are just two, right? There's only like one which gives us a variant and another one which gives us a mean. However, in principle, we can have arbitrary polynomials up here. And so these higher order moments are basically something describing this polynomial. Or with other words, they tell you the coefficients for the Taylor expansion. Yeah? It's all kind of interlocked, all these things. So there's in statistics also something like an expansion that you can then have. So, OK, so looking at the moments is telling me something about the distribution. So if I have a kernel function that compares now two classes, here's one sample and here's another one, that's quite fancy, yeah, that I can compare the moments 
without actually calculating them. Yeah? But in principle, that's what the polynomial is doing. It's like approximating the data sets. Let's say you have a, a degree p kernel. Yeah? It's like saying, OK, I approximate my distribution with a distribution that has a polynomial up to degree p, and then I compare the two distributions. Okay. Oh, OK, that was confusing. What about the linear kernel here? Now, the linear kernel, does it also go nicely with us? Yes, it does. The linear kernel compares only the first order moments, right? If I translate my expert only stuff. If I only compare the first order moments, what were the first order moments? Those were the means. It's like just comparing two means with each other. And if you have a, a complicated data set, yeah, <coughs> let's say here's my complicated data set, and here's another one, I don't know. This should be a heart or something. So I have two very complicated data sets that are definitely not Gaussian. However, if I take a linear kernel, we know we just, just get a straight line, right? That was our, our first attempt. So why is that? Because we model this class distribution just by its mean, and we model this just by its mean, and then we do comparison. OK? So having a kernel function is like, taking a particular set of glasses, OK? So you can take these ones, or I can take my other ones. It's like choosing a different kernel. When I take that one, now I see every one. I can see whether you're sleeping or not. If I take the other glasses, I cannot distinguish whether you're sleeping or not. I can just see my slides, OK? So it's just like putting different glasses on your head. And the same is with the choice of the kernel. You're putting different glasses when you look on the data, yeah? So when you take a linear kernel, you're saying, I just care for the means. And I want to compare the means. Question, yeah. Yeah, OK. So you said that um, you can have like upper order p, but do you need upper order p? So if you're, um, if you're not excited about comparing moments, like at a certain point, there's no um, additional information that you're gaining by going through. Yes, very good question. I, I repeat it for the microphone, OK? So the question is, do we really need all this p very large? So isn't aren't the small p's already sufficient, right? So that's the question. Um, for simple examples like that one, yes. But think of high dimensional spaces, MNIST, the shapes can be really very weird. And in that case, you, you need very weird mappings to linearly separate them. So it could happen that maybe you find out that um, for p equals 5, um, your data set is not linearly separable, right? But then for p equals 10, it is. But of course, p is a hyperparameter that needs to be chosen with cross validation. Did it answer? Uh, sort of. OK, um, sorry. <laughs> Yeah. The underlying distribution. Yeah. Um, so, like for the data, is there then also some sort of stopping point? Like maybe we don't know what it is, but is there some sort of stopping point where um, any like additional like moments beyond that have to be any more about the class distribution? Well, that may be beyond my capability. So the question is whether there's for every finite data set, let's say a finite data set, whether there's always some stopping point where we don't have to go beyond, right? Mm -hmm. And um, yes, maybe. Maybe yes, but um, OK, I can I make up now with, uh, some answer which sounds right, which might be wrong, OK? So if you take a finite p, it's like saying you have a parametric model. So you have finitely many parameters. So this is very head wavy. Yeah? So, but if the space gets infinitely dimensional, then I'm having a non-parametric model. So this is now statistics lingo. So parametric models are the ones where I have finitely many parameters. Non-parametric models are those where I can have arbitrarily many parameters. In particular, the more data I have, the more parameters I have. So in principle, if I limit myself to a particular p, I limit myself more like to a um, parametric world. And if I allow infinitely many dimensions in my feature space, then I'm in a non-parametric world. Um, Finitely many data points, let's say you have 10 data points in 1,000 dimensions, then these 10 data points, they live on a 10-dimensional subspace, right? They don't span the whole thing. So in principle, you can project it down, and you don't lose anything to a lower-dimensional space, right? However, it depends on the shape. Of course, also, when you think of linear regression, if you only have 
two points, you can always draw a straight line. When you have three points, you can draw a straight line, and it's an approximation, but you can always draw a parabola which goes through it. So somehow the complexity of my polynomial also depends on the number of data points. However, if the data points having some inner property like they could, so now here they lie by construction on some submanifold, but in principle one also expects, let's say, all face images, they lie on some lower dimensional manifold in image space, right? And all cow images, they lie on some lower dimensional manifold. But this is hand wavy uh, reasoning typically what people do. But they typically have the intuition that the data is on lower dimensional spaces. And uh, we will talk about PCA next time where one can analyze whether that's the case or not. Question? Right. But for the examples that we're using, the theory only needs the third dimension to make the yeah. operation. That's right. So, but I don't see any downside to the uh, first two dimensions other than maybe computational uh, flaws. But is there any uh, other curves that increase the dimension in such a way that the, it doesn't have a nice uh, linear? Um, yeah, it could. You mean the question is if I understood it right? So these examples were constructed so that they are nicely linearly separable, right? But could it be also like bad to do this, right? The question is uh, if we increase the dimensions of pieces of space, yeah. will it always get better or are there alternative yeah. that gets worse with more dimensions? It can get worse, but not necessarily. So it's unclear. You need to try it. So here's your 2D manifold, okay? And here's my mapping for p equals 100. And maybe that wasn't a good idea. But we are looking at this only in 3D. So maybe in 100 dimensions, it really looks nice. OK? So it's a um, thing from the computer science perspective. We are getting to, let's just try it on our data. I don't have a proof that it's always better or works. So it's more something. This is something, some great new hammers for your toolbox. Try it on your data, and when you can make money with it, great. Yeah. So, but the theory might be lacking. But it's very interesting to think about it. However, intuitively, increasing the dimensionality is multiplying your possibilities to find a way to linearly split the data. The good thing is also we don't have to do it perfectly usually, right? Um, since we have the non-separable case, and we can deal with that one. I'm not sure, maybe approximately I answered the question. OK. Anyway, so the takeaway, the polynomial kernel um, is a kernel you can use. And it has a nice interpretation that, in principle, it's comparing distributions and um, with different resolutions. OK? Here's another one, the Gaussian kernel. And now it gets a little bit com confusing. Gaussians, are we talking about probabilities here? No, it's just called the Gaussian kernel. But it looks like a Gaussian. But this is. We will see that for experts only, this is a probability distribution. But for us, that's yet another fancy way to calculate some nonlinear function on our entries in x and x prime. Yeah? It's a nonlinear function. And someone proved that it has the right properties, the magic property that it leads to a feature map. What does it do? It calculates distance, distances between two points. OK, those are also kind of inner products. And then e to the minus the distance. So it says if two points are almost the same, the distance is really small. So e to minus the distance will be 1. Okay? And if the distance is really large, then e to the minus a very large number will be 0. Okay? So it's also something, in this case, which is yeah, comparing two, two vectors. There's a bandwidth parameter, yet another hyperparameter. Why Gaussians? Um, okay, it measures similarity, as I just said. And the corresponding feature space will be infinitely dimensional, whatever that means. Yeah, that's more like now the marketing thing, like in an advertisement. So in principle, if you have finitely many data points, you always have a finite subspace where your data is, even if your feature space is infinitely dimensional. However, it can grow. The dimensionality can be arbitrarily in dimensional. So you can have basically for each data point a different dimension in this feature space. Okay. Experts-only version, 
So now the Gaussian kernel is also comparing class distributions, but using kernel density estimates. Okay, also fine, fun. So let's talk about kernel density estimates for a second. So what is the kernel density estimate? Um, so in density estimation, as a computer scientist, I would say, that is an unsupervised method where you're giving a point cloud and you want to estimate the PDF. OK, so that is the description. In statistics, maybe we would draw a picture like this. And I have samples from a random variable, maybe these ones. OK, those are samples from a one-dimensional random variable. And I would like to have the density and want to estimate that one. And there are many methods to do this. However, you see the difficulty here. I'm having here some discrete object, discretely many data points. And I want to say something continuous object here. Okay, And so there are many ways to do this. As I said, you could calculate the mean, you could calculate the variance, the third order moments, the fourth order moments, the fifth order moment, and so on and so forth. And this will give you a density in principle. However, using a Gaussian kernel is saying, put little Gaussian bumps at each of the data points. Okay, So what does it have to do with our Gaussian kernel? So let's call this x1, x2, x3, x4. Take this one, and here's an interesting function. So this is a Gaussian kernel where I plugged in one data point. Okay? And now this sigma here is basically this variance, so the width of such a little bump. And now by saying um, calculate the distance to some x, yeah, I'm basically getting this curve. So right at the one, uh, right at the point, the distance is zero, and I have e to the minus zero, which is one. And if I'm going further away, it kind of nicely fades it out. Okay, we are close to the kernel density estimate. Let's average it for all i, for all my data points. Okay, just sum them up, and this is like summing up all these little bumps. So why is it nice to sum up little, little hills? Because then the overall thing will be also something nice and smooth. right? The E function, I think, is infinitely many differentiable. So the summation of E function is also infinitely many differentiable. So the whole thing will have really nice properties. And as you see, so here's a little bump. So we get something here. Here are more concentrated. So here we get something higher. Okay. So this is the kernel density estimate. And there's lots of theory how to estimate this from your data, the sigma. That's the hyperparameter of the kernel density estimate. OK, interesting. So I got brand new glasses here, the Gaussian kernel glasses. I take them on. And now I'm seeing all my data sets as via kernel density estimate. And I compare them. OK? So that's also something useful. And that's a very, very common kernel. It's much more common than the polynomial kernel. OK? It's very versatile. However, you have another hyperparameter, the sigma squared. Question? I was going to ask about the sigma squared, but probably Yeah, yet another hyperparameter comes into the list of theta. And we set it by cross validation. Very right. Um, as I said, the effect of the sigma is uh, let's, um, let's make it smaller. OK, I, I should use a different color. But oh, let's put it up here. So let's make it smaller, then it looks like this. So now my kernel density estimate will also look like that one. OK, so now I have a smaller sigma. So here maybe sigma squared being equal to 10. And this is sigma squared being equal to 1. OK, I can also make sigma squared to 100. OK, sigma squared to 100. <coughs> I will get one big bump for the first data point, and another big bump, and another, and another, and another. And so the overall density will be something like this. You see, kernel density estimate is interesting, and I view hyperparameters often like a turning knob in an old radio. Okay, So you can tune in and out, and this looks boring, this looks boring, and this looks nice. Okay, but. That's hyperparameter choice. That's no easy, not, not so easy to tune. Okay. 
We, we, we use our ears for that one. Okay, like this is an experts only. Now we are experts maybe, yeah? If not, you forget to ask something. You, you should ask a question. But this is an expert's view on the Gaussian density. As to, uh, on the, not Gaussian density, for the Gaussian kernel function. And again, let me stress, here we are not talking about probability so much. So this is more like yet another way to look at your data, how to generate interesting feature maps. Here's it now is a very weird one. By the way, there's a, this nice book from Kevin Murphy. There's a new version. And in the old version, it was chapter 14. He lists many of these possible kernel functions that you can use. Yeah? It's like having, OK, great, screw, screwdrivers are great. And now you can have large ones and small ones. And you can have flat one or torques or whatever. And you have all these different models. And those are the kernel functions. Let's have some for documents. And here I'm really talking about text. So you have a .txt file on your, on your um, hard drive. And you say one text file is one data point. OK? This doesn't look like a vector space something, right? It's just a sequence of text. So how can I write a kernel function down for it? Um, in principle, why not, right? I mean, all you have to do is you have to tell me if I have document one, or let's say this is whatever, d.txt, and here's another one, e.txt. You have to tell me how to calculate a number from it, right? But you can do many things. You could count numbers or blah, blah, blah. However, there's one caveat. It must have the right magic property, that it's really a kernel function. And I haven't told you it, which is what it is. But when it fulfills this nice property and it calculates a real number, great. Then we can run our support vector machine on text. So the kernel function is kind of translating any data type yeah, into something that can be used with a support vector machine. So. We could do it like this. We could use a so-called bag of words representation. So we have a long list of words called a dictionary. And we just count for each text file how often the particular word appears in the text. Right? So there might be some texts which contain lots of offside soccer goal and whatever world championship. And then there are others which contain more words like inflation, unemployment, and blah, blah, blah. And so from these two word lists, you immediately see, yeah, of course, one may be from sports, and the other one might be from the um, economics page in the newspaper. Okay, It's very oft obvious. So let's make really large vectors. And then when we have these vectors, let's t take the inner product. Why the inner product? Let's say in the economics newspaper, there are certain words don't appear, like goal and soccer. And they will be multiplied with the entries from the other document, but 0 times something will be 0. Yeah? So they are not similar. However, if you have two texts from s about soccer, so in one might be 5 goals, in the other one might be 10 goals or 2 goals, and you multiply these numbers, and they add up, and then two documents will be similar. Okay? So just take the inner product of these long word vectors. Yeah? And this is the measure of similarity. Now, here we normalize by the lengths. OK, you can start designing these functions. Yeah? Why normalize? Because yeah, the length of a document should be irrelevant. right? So there could be short articles. There should be, could be long articles. But they could be both on the same topic. So it's a normalized inner product. And oh, this is measuring the cosine of the angle. So here's the formula. OK, so this is the cosine between those two. OK? And I don't derive it for you now on the board, but it is using some Pythagoras and something and making a triangle in a unit circle, and then you see that this is calculating the cosine of the angle between the two vectors. OK? Um, yes, all nice properties. They are more sophisticated kernels. There's the TFIDF term frequency. That's something we talked about. Inverse document frequency. That is basically saying certain words appear too often. Let's say the, the article the or the word is or some other so-called stop words sometimes. And they will dominate the inner products between two vectors. So you should, if they are everywhere, you should weigh them down. Okay? And that's then the inverse document frequency part of it. Okay? Here's another one. Let's say you are doing, um, having two strings, not two files, but two strings. Yeah? More abstract. Those could be genomes. Okay? 
So let's define a, a kernel function for those, right? So that would be useful. So here's one. So first of all, definition. So we call something a substring of S if X can be written like USV. Okay, so far so simple. So it's like programming 101. Um, then we could, for some substring S, yeah, we could count the number of times that a certain substring appears in here. And here's our kernel function. Count the number of substrings the two strings have in common. So this is a gigantic summation yeah, over all possible substrings of my alphabet. It's really, 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 really large. And then those are the counts. And I can put some weights. Maybe the weight is calculated from the length of the substrings. I'm happy if they are longer sequences. Not so important if they are smaller sequences. Or I could take the total number of strings of length 5 as an inverse weighting or something like this. And this is the so-called string kernel, OK? And it was a big paper, I think also JMLR or something, 2000, 200 something, OK? And why was it a paper? Because, of course, this is something we want to have, right? We want to compare genomes. We want to compare DNA. But the files are really, really large. So it's a big deal when you can calculate it in linear time. And they showed using suffix tree that this can be uh, calculated in linear time. However, I don't know whether the kernel people invented this algorithm for comparing these two strings. But some people in the algorithms department, they gave us a method so that it can be calculated in linear time and length of the strings. And that is really a big deal, OK, that you can calculate this thing in linear time. OK, great. We could go on and on and on. Of course, the typical alphabet is ACTG, so that is the one from bioinformatics. Um, Let's say you are working in biology and you're having fish and you're making whatever. You want to see the phenotype and making JPEGs of your fish after one week, after two weeks, three weeks, four weeks. And then you have different gene variations and you want to compare them. Use a support vector machine. Just define a kernel function for your JPEG files. Okay? And you can be creative and compare the JPEG files. You can calculate whatever, the Fourier spectrum of the images and then do some inner products or whatever, so you can go wild. So whatever has then at the end the right kernel properties which are still secret, and I know you're already eager to learn about them. OK, so you can, in principle, with the kernel function, one thing is first, it's a feature extractor going from low D and high D, but the more abstract way is to get your data set into the support vector world. OK, you just need to define a similarity function. OK, here's a famous kernel trick. So you have an existing linear algor algorithm and you want to have a nonlinear version, then you need the following requirement. If your linear algorithm, algorithm is only looking at dot products of your data, then it's very easy to kernelize by just replacing all the dot products with the kernel function. That's it. That's the recipe. And many examples. Um, let's apply to SVMs. OK? And by now, it should be trivial for you, right? So where are the inner products? They are over here. OK, let's replace them first. OK, fine. Map to feature space. But of course, we don't want to do this calculation. It could be really, really high dimensional. So let's replace that one by the kernel function. And that's it. That is the nonlinear support vector machine. OK, we just replace the inner product by a kernel function. Good. So far, so good. Ah, some technicalities. How do we calculate W? Right? And when we think about it, the W has the same shape as the inputs, which were x, but now they are phi of x. And now we're saying, ah, infinitely dimensional and blah, blah, blah. What about the W? The W has the same shape, right? Um, we cannot calculate the W, possibly. However, also, there's a trick. If you write it out, if you write out this function that we know that this is a decision function that we want to have, and you plug everything in, yeah, it turns out that also this function is only looking at the data using inner products. OK? So we just replace them with the kernel function. So with other words, we do not calculate w anymore. We don't calculate it anymore. We directly use this formula down here. OK? What about the b? The b, everything is fine. The b can be calculated as before. The only difficulty here was the w. OK? So far, so good. Let's have a quick demo. OK, so here are a couple of implementations for kernel functions. Yeah? 
again, uh, that's the difficulty is only in uh, thinking about is the data along the rows, is the data along the columns, and then uh, to have some, uh, to get the code right, right? This is like the um, inner product of all the rows in X. A uh, little X is basically capital X on the slide, okay? So it's multiplying each row of X, which are the patterns, which each of the other ones. So where's, oh yeah, that, that just is. Okay, so this is the raw data. And this is calculating now the inner product simultaneously for all data points. So that's the fancy thing. So the X and X prime is not a single vector, but it's like a big matrix of vectors. And by calculating these outer products, I'm just doing it for everyone at the same time. So the output of my function here will be a matrix. And it will be called the kernel matrix because it has all the evaluations. Maybe since that step might be a bit um, unclear, I, let me write it down once so that no one is confused. So, as I said, we are interested in these entries here, right? And for example, for ij, for two data points, those are the inner products that we need to calculate. Of course, we plug them all into a big matrix. So we will have here kx1, and here we have kx1, xn, and so forth. And this matrix will be called K. Now, surprisingly, for the polynomial kernel, this can be calculated like this. Or plus 1, let's say B is equal to 1, to the power of P. Um, where the X is now X1 transpose yeah, to Xn transpose. So every row is a pattern. And then we have, in this case, row times column, row times column, so it will be just right, OK? Um, of course, we don't, like phase, we, we don't like for loops in Python. We want to have for loops in BLAS or in some other super fast matrix library. We, we never want to have it in, or we rarely want to have it in Python. Um, what about these operations? OK, this is already a matrix, plus 1 is basically plus the scalar, so it's adding it to every entry. To the power of p does not mean I need to multiply the matrix with itself. Again, this is component-wise to the power of p. OK? So that is the mass behind this implementation here. It gets surprisingly simple. It almost looks like the formula for a single vector. However, only if you tweak the code long enough. So here's the linear kernel. Great. We can just call the polynomial kernel and set p equal to 1. Here's the Gaussian kernel. Again, the x is a big data matrix. Um, first, we calculate all distances. And for the all distances formula, again, we use another trick. Uh, and that is the trick that I wrote already on the board. So the squared ones, they can be calculated with the inner products. Yeah, as I said, this, the distances are the same as these ones. So these inner product matrix, it's very easy to calculate. It's just this one. Yeah? And then by cleverly reshaping, transposing, taking the diagonal, blah, 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 I can calculate all distances in one expression. Okay? And so this is the one expression here. So this is like um, squaring all entries, summing them up, blah, blah, blah. And this is doing the same for the prime. So this is just doing the right thing. So this is the, the 2D version of it. Copy and paste it into an empty cell and play around with it. OK, and then you see that it works. Of course, I check this before I put it into code. I, I have to check it by hand as well. I also do this. But I erase these cells already. And then I just say e to the minus all distances squared divided by the parameter. OK, so that is my kernel matrix for the Gaussian kernel. Um, OK, so here's another one, sample inside out. OK, that is basically the same as before. 
inside samples and outside samples. And let's calculate a Gaussian kernel function and let's look at the matrix. So I'm using here an imshow. I don't know, I, it's, it's some imshow was some function up here from Plotly. I, I defined it myself. And this is now showing me, okay, the first 50 points, they are in the center and they are close by each other and then the other points are outside. Yeah, those are the other ones. And you can see in the center, everyone is very close by. Yeah, so we have entries of one. And here we have another cluster. Those are the entries which are outside. So they are sometimes neighbors, but sometimes not. However, ideally here we don't have them. Yeah? So by sorting your data set, first having everyone from class one, then having everyone from class two, you can then visualize also your kernel matrix and see oh, what is a good parameter. Okay, so let's change the parameter and see what's happening. So let's say I'm, I'm doing 10, okay? Sigma equals 10 means instead of having little bumps at every data point, I now have very wide bumps, which means suddenly everyone is neighbor with each other. Okay, so let's run this. And, oh, that wasn't enough, so let's make it even larger. So now you see also the other class gets being neighbor of the other ones, and these ones, they are almost close to one. Okay, however, if I make it too small, everyone gets more lonely because you only have these little bumps and there are not so many points close by anymore. So in a way, by the way, so that's yet another side note. This is almost like a smooth k-nearest neighbor or a smooth one-nearest neighbor, right? A density estimate, a kernel density estimate is basically asking, so if I have a point x right here, so who's my neighbors? And the ones that are your neighbors, they give you some non-zero value, okay? However, it's a, it's, a, it's a smoothed out version of the nearest neighbor thing, yeah? So it's like with your turning knob, with your radio thing here that you can fiddle around with, you can like increase or lower the distance. Okay, great, so this is a thing now to choose a good, sh to find a good one, so but just by visualization. By the, one, by the way, the fun thing about the kernel matrix is, um, do you know what the dimensionality of the data is? Actually, you don't, right? We didn't look. And actually, it doesn't matter. The visualization always works. It doesn't matter whether you have two-dimensional data, one-dimensional, or whether you have 1,000-dimensional data. The kernel matrix will be always the matrix telling you how close by are points with each other, okay? So that is a very useful thing to look at. Okay, let's go on. We wanted to get to the implementation of the nonlinear SVM. So let's look at the fancy nonlinear case. Of course, we are implementing the dual. Why? Because we can just copy and paste the code. Yeah, that's easier. There are not many things to change. The only thing that changes is now, instead of having here x times x transpose, as before, now we have the kernel matrix, which was just calculated with our kernel function. And the rest stays the same. Of course, there are some subtleties now for the w. We don't calculate the w. In, instead, I'm, I'm returning here a function, right? I mean. We like functional programming, let's return a function. So the function is using, of course, my kernel function as well, right? Because I cannot calculate a w in full generality. And again, I can calculate an accuracy, blah, blah, blah. Let's look at a two-dimensional toy example. Here comes some how to show the margin in 2D. So that was something not so easy. But here's the example. OK, so now this is the separating plane, and those are the margins. The margins look randomly like around, right? So what is, why is this a margin? That's really strange. That's just because in very high dimensional space, yeah, in particular, if, if you map your data like this, and then you chop with a hyperplane, then you get very weird reprojection when you then project it back into 2D. Like the, let's say you take this one, you can do it, and you take a scissor and cut it into two pieces. And then when you look at the shapes, they will be very complicated. And that's the same as what's happening here. And this was the case which is not separating. So we can play around with the hyperparameters here, right? So we can, let's say, let's change it from, uh, so 0 .0, 0 0.01 was saying, yeah, my slack variables are not very important. So it's fine to have slack, OK? So it's OK that there are some of them wrong. I more prefer to have a really nice shape. Now, what's happening if I increase the C? 
And now for the nonlinear case, it's getting more interesting. I'm getting something more complicated. So this is now not nice and round anymore, but now it's getting more like a weird shape. And I can even increase it and say, no, I really don't want to have slack. I, I really don't like slack. So let's see what's happening now. Then you see now it's trying to find a shape that fits all the data. Okay? So you see now the hyperparameter becomes much more important. And of course, if this was just noise up here, yeah, then cross-validation will tell us, no, the hyperparameter C should be smaller. So this is overfitting the data. So again, by increasing C now, we can overfit the data. Okay? Let's again make it very, really small. Let's say very small. I'm not sure whether I get a an error message here. Ah, okay. Now I want to have it really small. How about this one? No. 0 0.8. Ah, it's still working. Yeah, okay. So you see the shape gets really strange and the margin got really large. Okay? Because you have so much slack in here. Okay, so that's a nonlinear. Of course, we need to have a three dimensional nonlinear example just because it's cool. So, this is this one, and this is just the inside out example. And you have an ether egg, okay? So, there's like a surface, and then one inside and one outside surface of this one. And again, if I change the C here, um, let's make it, let's say, no, slack is really bad, okay? Slack is really bad, so let's. Run it, and ideally the shape gets more complicated. And it didn't get more complicated. Whatever. It's still an egg. Okay. Yeah, I don't know. Let's, let's make it even larger. So let's see. Now I want to see whether it's... Oh, this was a mistake. So like this. Okay. It, maybe my data set was already separable, and so it doesn't matter very much here. Um, Class shift 4. Maybe I make the class shift smaller. Okay. So let's try this. Okay. It's not with me now. Okay. It doesn't like me. Okay. You can play around with it. And finally, yet another example. My computer is really slowing down. What's going on? Okay, this one. So here you, you see nicely so that I designed so that you more see the surface and... Um, it is quite nice. It's also a nice visualization here with this Plotly library. And um, in data science in general, it's important to look at the data, right? And so this allows you, at least for these cases, to look at the data. And so it's not a black box. However, of course, we get new hyperparameters. For the polynomial kernel, we have the to the power of p, in principle, also the b, yeah, the offset. But that might be not such a big deal. For the Gaussian kernel, we have the sigma, um, but there are more hyperparameters. Basically, each kernel function is a different model, right? And so you need to do model selection between different kernel functions. Okay, so far so good. A couple of minutes left. Now, what is a kernel function? I haven't told you. And um, actually, it's the question, what is a PD kernel function, okay? What is this PD thing? So that is a property that the kernel function must fulfill. Um, first of all, Sometimes you find different definitions. Those are the ones that I like. So first of all, a kernel function is a symmetric function. Symmetric means it doesn't matter in which order you plug in the input. Okay? So that's one property that we need. And of course, every feature map phi induces a kernel function. Yeah? Induces is some math lingo which you might know, right? So given a phi, I can write down a k. That's inducing. So how do I do this? I just multiply this with each other, and this is defining my kernel function. It's like you have an implementation for phi, great, then you have an implementation for k. Big question is, you have an implementation for k, give me an implementation for phi. So this is more difficult, okay? And in general, this is not the case. However, if your function is positive definite, yeah, then it's fine. And this statement should generate a type error in your head, a function should be positive definite. Positive definiteness was for linear algebra, and it was about matrices. So how can you apply it to functions, OK? And that's what I show you on the next slide. It's from functional analysis. Functional analysis is a topic in math which, for me as a layman, OK, it's just le generalizing linear algebra to functions in a way, approximately. So 
let's recall what was positive definiteness. So it was defined for a squared matrix K, for example, yeah? And it was defined in such a way if I take any vector and multiply it from the left hand to the right of my matrix, I get a scalar. And if this scalar is positive, then I call my function, uh, my matrix positive definite. Okay, so that's positive definiteness. And um, then we have a nice eigenvalue decomposition and so on and so forth. So uh, all eigenvalues are positive, that's another way to say it. As a side note, I hope there are not too many side notes, but so here's another side note. This is the right generalization of positivity to matrices, right? If you have a single matrix with many entries, what does it mean that the matrix is positive, right? That's unclear. But positive definiteness, that is the one that is generalizing positivity to matrices. Okay, so that is the one that you know or that you just learned for matrices. Um, now, if we have finitely many data points, x1 to xn, and we have a kernel function, then we can always define our kernel matrix, right? So this kernel matrix has just all these entries, and that's a finite n by n matrix, and it gets a special name. It's also called the so-called Gram matrix, yeah? So it's the inner product matrix. Great. So now we can define a kernel function is positive definite, yeah? If for any choice of data points, the corresponding Gram matrix is positive definite. Okay, so that is the way to do it. So we have a definition in the finite discrete case. So we have finitely, discreetly many entries in our matrix. And in a way, if a kernel is an infinitely dimensional matrix with continuously many columns and rows, right? It's a function of two inputs. If you view the inputs like the row and column indices, then the function is just, with two inputs, is just generalizing the notion of a matrix. And the way in math these things are often defined are, is the way that we collapse these infinite objects to finite objects, and then we use the properties for finite objects, okay? As a side note. So in, here we had something like for any vector multiplied from the left and the right, and here we have for any data set, okay? Calculate the kernel matrix, and if it's positive definite, then everything is great. So a kernel function is generating positive definite kernel matrices, then it is a PD kernel, a positive definite kernel. And there is also the notion of semi-definite, right, which is instead of having greater than, uh, greater than zero, we have greater or equal than zero, right, but those are details. Okay, let's have a little change of notation for the remainder, last five minutes, let's say, last five minutes. So now let's have again the data points along the columns, okay? You just need to have these two representations always ready and be able to flip a bit for this one, okay? So here's my data set X. Um, now, just want to explain you on the re in the remainder why positive definite is the property that we need. So far, I just told you that is the property that we need, but why do we need it? Again, let's look at the simple case. Let's look at the linear kernel function. When we calculate the kernel matrix, now we can write it as X transpose X. Yeah, remember on the board we wrote x times x transpose, but that was using the other notation where I'm having row vectors. The nice thing, if I have column vectors, then my inner product matrix looks like an inner product. So the kernel matrix contains all these inner products, thus my feature map is just the identity. Okay, I, I can just read it off from this factorization. Okay, and now the trick is, if my kernel function is positive definite, then I always have such a factorization, and I can read off a feature map. So here's a nonlinear kernel function. I calculate the kernel matrix. Now, for a positive definite matrix, uh, kernel function, my kernel matrix also factorizes. And now this might be a hole in your head. Let me show you why. So if I have a symmetric matrix, yeah, it has the following eigenvector decomposition. We talk about much more about eigenvector decomposition in the next lecture, is this knowledge is a bit rusty, in the context of PCA, yeah? Just accept it, it's rotation, then a scaling of the axis, and then rotation back, okay? So that is an eigenvector decomposition. If the kernel function is PD, the kernel matrix is PD, and for that reason, all eigenvalues, the ones that are in this diagonal matrix lambda here, they're all positive numbers. So all the diagonal entries are positive. If they are positive, I can take the square root of them, yeah? 
and rewrite my kernel matrix as a product of two matrices, right? So here I'm having the square root of a diagonal matrix, which is the diagonal matrix where I take the square root of all the entries. Here I'm having the same matrix transpose and I multiply them with each other. So I found a Z to factorize it. Great. So I can just read off the feature map to be phi of xi being equal to zi. Okay, zi are just the columns of z. Let's step back. So is that fine for everyone? Approximately. So saying a matrix is positive definite means I can take the square root of the matrix. Yeah, and that's not doesn't. It sounds a little bit wrong, but actually it's true. So we can take the matrix square root. So there is something like a matrix square root, which is this one, for example. Okay, so we can just read it off, as I say, and thus we see that the positive definite of my kernel function is just the right property that my kernel matrix factorizes. However, it's, it's an existence result. We can, of course, think about the dimensionality here. And we know if we have an n by n matrix, my feature map here will be at least n-dimensional. However, there is a solution which is n-dimensional, which I just showed you on the previous slide, right? Because these matrices, this is n by n, then my diagonal matrix has n entries on the diagonal. So it's possible. However, there are many more. So before I show you the sketchy summary, so there's there's an appendix, which is the old slide, which I took out, not because people were complaining, but because it was maybe too complicated. Okay, So that is about SVD, and we look at it next time. But then there are many more things, many more possibilities how to write down a feature map. And here's another option, and yet another option. And there are many different versions for this feature map. So given the kernel functions, there are different ways to get feature maps. This one is particularly cool. So here's a feature space, it's a function space, the, the space of all functions from x to r. So this is also a possible feature space. So what does it mean? The feature space is not unique. Yeah? So given the kernel function, there are many different options to write a feature map that gives you this inner product. Okay? And that's discussed in this reproducing kernel Hilbert space chapter. Yeah? The phrase reproducing kernel Hilbert space, that's like a phrase that you read very often in this paper. And it's a phrase from functional analysis. Okay? And let me tell you, it's not difficult. It's just an unknown notation for you. But it's just linear algebra at the end. OK, let's flip back to the summary. Of course, if you are eager to look at this, look at it. Okay, This uh, singular value decomposition reminder will come next time when we talk about PCA anyway. OK, here's the summary. So the sketchy summary for the PD-ness of kernel functions was they must be symmetric, then it is a kernel function, and positive definite, because then I can take the square root of matrices. And when I can take the square root of matrices, I'm sure there is a feature map. OK? So as an outlook in function and analysis, we look at functions instead of vectors. But many of the things translate nicely. And also, kernel functions are sometimes called positive linear operators, right? That's just operators because they are like function functions, kind of. Yeah? An operator is something from functional analysis, uh, from functional programming in a way, OK? Good. Support vector machine summary. So we looked at the classification problem. I explained it a thousand times already. We developed the full fledged super duper SVM in three steps. We first looked at the linearly separable case to get the right optimization problem to learn why minimizing the norm of W is maximizing the margin, okay? And to get our hands dirty on Lagrange multipliers. Then we looked at the linearly non-separable case. As an exercise, we found out that there's only a little constraint that we need to add in the dual, and everything is fine. And finally, we looked at the kernel trick to get the nonlinear case. When you look at books or when you look at um, some papers, typically all these three steps are mixed together, and you have to do everything in parallel. Yeah? So when you get confused, go back to the lecture and look at the three steps. Okay. And then this is basically the final algorithm is this optimization problem. And by now, you know what to do with an optimization problem. Great. That's it for today. Thanks for your attention. And I see you on Wednesday.